Good morning. Good morning. All the smiling faces. Yeah. The cold we got to do this one down. It is good to see all of you this morning, considering the weather. And of course, I was out last night walking the dog about 10 o'clock, and my neighbor asked me to talk about the snow and how much we were enjoying it. He said, You know, if you look out across here, it looks like diamonds. It was pure and white, just like. Jesus and a diamond. I mean, you know, there you go. Think about that for a minute or two. Like I said, it's good to see all of you this morning. Our early hymn this morning is Blessed Be Your Name. <laughs> Blessed be your name, the man that is plentiful, which means all of my grace of blessed be your name. Blessed be your name, for down in the desert place, the walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in the morning, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the glory. Blessed be your name, the sun shining down on me, the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name, for the world in my fist of glory, the team in the property. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out now, turn back to praise. Where the darkness flows, there is in the Lord, still I will stay. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Thank you. 
as excited every week about the Lord's Day as the world is for the one week of the year. Communion here is blessed redeemer. <laughs>
Especially thankful for the gift of the Holy Spirit and for His Son who walked this earth and showed us the way and died on the cross that our sins may be forgiven. So this morning, Father, we'd like to give something back to you with our tithes and offerings. Father, we ask that they be used to advance your kingdom here on earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, evening worship tonight at 6, Wednesday, uh, Women of Faith and Fellowship at 9 to 11, a prayer and Bible study at 6 o'clock, Saturday, Kids Fun Night from 6 to 8, a new converts class that was scheduled at 4 o'clock today that had been canceled, so we we'll keep that in mind. And if you want to have photographs taken, we can take your family's photo today and next Sunday following the service, see Brother Dean. Next Ladies Night Out is this Thursday, February 7th, 6 30 p.m. So those are enough. Let's leave those in mind. Our next praise hymn is Hallelujah, Praise Ye the Lord. I'm not going to be meeting at the right time to see where it is. Hallelujah, <laughs> <laughs> 
in drawing the trigger. Make sure that you cause as much division as you can. Make sure others know that you're upset. Start as many arguments as you can in the church. And then the leadership has to go around and put out all those fires and be able to focus their attention on helping the church grow. Number three, he said, make sure you don't build any relationships outside the church, especially with unbelievers. I mean, mom taught you as a kid, didn't you? Don't talk to strangers. Say, hey, we're just obeying mom, all right? So don't, don't associate with anybody outside the church. Number four, this is my personal favorite. If you don't want your church to grow, lock the doors of the church them just before worship. <laughs> And because it is your church, so lock the doors. And uh, you can lock the doors if you want. If people start to knock, just sing louder like the weird day. Eventually they'll go away. Number five, he said, if you don't want your church to grow, talk badly about your church to everybody you can. Be sure to tell them how much you dislike your church. You're not happy about that nasty color they painted in the nursery. Well, I'd vote against that if I find that voice now. Be sure to tell your hairdresser how long winded your preacher is. And don't forget to tell your neighbor all about the fight you started with the greeters that week. Just focus on the negative. Spread it around to everybody that you can to make sure everybody in town knows how unhappy you are about the direction the church is going. Number six. Some of you smile because you've heard this. You've seen this happen out there, haven't you? Number six, discourage new people from getting involved in connecting. Now, even though you're trying hard to make sure your church doesn't grow, he says, sometimes folks are still running from you. have some new folks show. So the solution is tell them to stand and see, tell them they can't help in the church at all for at least six months. And before they do, they're going to have to take a 25 week course before they're even permitted to take out the stretch. Uh, he's, <laughs> I mean, you can't just have that right taken out the stretch. You know? so make sure they don't get involved. This will discourage them. And eventually, they'll get the message they'll leave. You want to speed up the process, he says, in this particular point during praise and music time. Make sure you scare me now. Give me a bag of so, okay. Number seven, make sure you don't show any excitement. In the church, don't smile, don't laugh, don't do under anything that might resemble that you're having a good time. Because church is supposed to be serious, right? And so don't smile. Come in every Sunday like you just got baptized in lemon juice. And if anybody's excited, you can just try to discourage the best you can. Tell them, hey, what you're trying to do is not going to work. Try that for one more. Number eight, don't help your community. He said, if you don't want your church to grow, don't do any outreach. Not the church call out of you. And so don't go out of your way to help those in need. If you drive by that homeless person, just keep telling yourself, I know it's because they're drugs, it's, it's, it's all their fault. So, you know, they made their bed, they can sleep in it. And when people do come into the church needing help, make sure you let them know, we're not here to help people. We'll let the big church in town, the big city do that. Number nine, you know, one of my, again, one of my personal favorites, because I like to have this, like when I used to lean up at the church camp, uh, make sure so you have a long list of rules on your front door. I remember doing a week of camp several years ago, and I had like four pages of rules. It took, it took no kidding, an hour to go over all the with the kids, you know. So it, it was a real damper to say the least. But anyway, put them on the front door and make sure the page is full, you know, and at the top of the list, have a dress code so people know what they're allowed to wear and what they're not. And uh, the more constricting, the better. And second on the list, this would get rid of Aaron Capers right away. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know if I told you about this last night, but he said at the, at the start it should be no copy. No copy. That'll get rid of it, Richard. <laughs> no copy. So that'll get rid of 50% of the people right off the bat. No raised hands in worship. Women, no wearing pants. No, no, no. The more, more constricting, the better. And then number 10. Be sure to keep all your activities within the church building. Don't go outside and do anything. Don't go on any mission trips. No outreach. Don't do any outings with the church members. Stay out of touch with the world and stay out of touch with each other. And maybe, just maybe, hopefully someday, people will forget that you even meet down at that level and they'll go somewhere else. That's 10 ways how to make sure your church does not grow. How many of those you would like to see the church grow? Right? And you know it starts with self-improvement. It starts with the individual. I put on your on your seats there, you have a basic outline. Actually, it's the actual article written by a minister years ago. A minister by the name of A. W. Tozer. I don't know much about the man. He was born in 1897, died in 1963. He was an American minister. He was not from the Church of Christ or the Christian Church. He was a minister for the Christian and Missionary Alliance. 
I know very little, if anything, nothing actually about that church or the teaching. But when I read years ago this particular article, I found it profound in its points do have scriptural backing. So I thought, for your benefit, I'd like to share that with you this morning, and in addition to what's listed there on that page, also provide scripture that goes along with these points. Because to me, you know, a minister or a teacher or a professor or an author, this man authored over 40 books, they can give you advice on how to improve your life. They've got diet programs to improve your life. There's folks out there with self-improvement that be a better speaker and all those things. Those are nice. But when it comes down to offering biblical teaching, uh, even from a minister here, uh, you can't back it up by scripture. If it's not found in the Word of God, it's not worth it, worth its salt to share. Does that make sense? And so I want to give you something this morning I think is worth its salt. And as I said earlier, improvement for the body begins with improvement in the individual. And also understand, I think it was the same years ago, as goes the family, so goes the nation. Well, in like fashion, as goes the individual Christian, so also goes the entire church. Because a chain, someone said, is only as strong as its weakest link. And so if we were to measure the strength of our congregation by your individual strength, how strong would we be? And if we took the collective strengths of all of us and put it together, and when we put in our individual strength, our grade, so to speak, our spiritual grade, how will it how will it affect the overall average of the grade of the body of Christ? Would we would our contribution, our strength, would it raise the standard of grade or would it lower it? And so I thought I'll offer these to you this morning as well. Um, Ten ways to make sure your church does grow. And the first thing he mentions is get thoroughly dissatisfied. With yourself. Complacency is the deadly enemy of the spiritual progress. The contented soul is the stagnant soul. A couple of scriptures here for your consideration. First of all, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26. How many of you have heard this before? You can either jot these down on your notes there. Uh, I hope you're taking notes. I think these are scriptures that will help and strengthen. Uh, if you're able to turn to them in your Bibles, please feel welcome to do that as well. We believe that an open Bible is, is, a, is a healthy Bible, it leads to a healthy life. In fact, I saw the other day, it's, it's something that a man can do for a woman that's better than opening the door. Do you know what it is? He can open his Bible. He can open his Bible and read it and follow it. Ephesians 4, 26, you ever heard this? It says, be ye angry and sin not. Be ye angry and sin not. You say that everything. Be ye angry and sin not. Uh, we've always thought that, you know, that basically meant we're allowed to get angry. Just make sure you don't sin when you, when you do get angry. I'm going to give you the literal tenning of that in the Greek language, what was meant when he wrote those words. What he was actually saying when he wrote it in the verbiage, the tense of the verbiage, just to make it clear and simple, here's what he was saying. Be angry and stop your sin. Be angry and stop your sin. You ever angry with yourself about the sin you committed? You go upset. That's the right thing to do. Because then it says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Get angry about your sin. Stop the sin. Don't let the sun go down before you stop the sin. Vacate the sin. And so Ephesians 4, verse 1. That, that has to do with get thoroughly dissatisfied with yourself. Here's another scripture that I think is important here. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Apostle Paul said, test yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. Examine yourself. Examine yourselves. Don't you recognize this about yourself that Christ is in you unless you fail the test? He says, I trust you realize that we do not fail the test. Again, how are our test scores in living for Christ affecting the average grade of the whole body of Christ? How many of you know that when it comes to cancer, we do cancer screening, right? We do cancer screening. So why not do sin screening in our life? Open the word of God, examine ourselves, and as the scripture says in Psalm 139, search me, O God, know my heart, try me, see if there be any wicked, hurtful way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. <laughs> Psalm 139, verse 23, 24. How many of you know that when you point the finger at somebody, there's three or four coming right back? Turn the examination upon yourself. And look for self-improvement. Number two, you're going to do that. Prepare for this. 
set your face like a flint toward, toward a sweeping transformation of your life. In other words, have some grit, have some determination. Tozer said, timid experiments are taken for failure before they start. We must throw our whole soul into our desire for God. Here are three scriptures that deal with all our heart being in it. The first from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 5 to 9. He probably quoted verbatim the Bible simply says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. In Acts 8, Acts 8, 37, when the Ethiopian was hearing the gospel message, he said unto Philip, What prevents me from being baptized? It's a good question for you today. If you're not been baptized, this is your decision, the choice of yours. But Philip said to him, If you believe with all your heart, you may. The Bible said the Ethiopian commanded the chariot to stop. They both went down to the water. Philip baptized the Ethiopian, and they both went on their way to Jordan. The Ethiopian did, and Philip kept on preaching. He said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And then in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, Paul said that when it comes to being a servant of God, that we are to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. So I'm going to ask you, what part of your body does God want? All of it. He wants all of it. And then we present our bodies as living sacrifices. That takes grit. That takes some determination. It'll be tough, but it's worth it. Number three. So it says, put yourself in the way of blessing. <clears throat> That's a little different way of saying things than we say. What we're saying is position yourself so that when God's blessing comes, you'll receive his blessing. He says it's a mistake to expect God's help to come as a windfall apart from conditions known and met. You're going to have to stop and say, he's speaking in 1960 lingo, and it's different than what I've used. And what he's saying is you cannot expect God's blessing to come if you are not personally willing to know or experience or meet what is required to receive that blessing. Like obedience, like devotion, like being dedicated, like being committed, like having the desire. And so as he concludes here on point three, he says to desire revival, but at the same time, neglect prayer and devotion is to wish one way and walk another. So how do we place ourselves in the way of God's blessing? Again, I'd like to give you some scripture for that. Is that okay? In Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. This is how we place our way in the, in the way of God's blessing. In fact, I'd like to turn with you just for 30 seconds or so, if I can get there in that amount of time, and, and share what the psalmist said. He puts it better than, than I can. This is the essence of placing ourselves in the way of God's blessing. In Psalm 1, verse 1, how blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sin, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He'll be like a tree firmly planted by the streams of water, which yields its fruit in a season, and its leaf does not wither. And whatever he does, he prospers. Talks about that tree planted firmly by the streams of water. When the storms come, that tree is going to stand firm because its roots go deep. Maisie said the other day, in fact, in the last several days, she's been saying, You can't go on vacation anymore, Grandma. I said, Why can't we go on vacation? She said, Well, if you go on vacation, another tree will fall. <laughs> because the last two times we've gone on vacation, we've had major windstorms in the area. I guess just us leaving is causing the great bank to fall. <laughs> and uh, we've lost several trees every time we've gone out of town. So Maisie's Maisie convinced. I said, honey, I see trees can fall even while we get out of I said, you just can't go on vacation anymore. Well, that tree, that tree is going to stand firm because its roots go deep. And so if you're asking, well, how can I place my, myself in the way of God's blessing? Verse 1 and 1 and 2 just line it all out. Don't walk with the wicked. Don't stand with the sinner. Don't sit in the seat of the scoffer. Make sure you delight in God's law day and night. And if you do this, God will bless you. You'll be placing yourself. Is there any value in that? Well, Proverbs chapter 20, verse 7 speaks of the value of it when he says, A righteous man who walks in his integrity, how blessed are his sons after him. So not only do we place ourselves in the place to receive blessing, but if we walk with integrity before God, 
we also bring blessing to our posterity, to those who come after us. And it required being single-minded. James chapter 1, verse 7 talks about double-minded individuals. They won't receive anything. They'll never expect to receive anything from the Lord. So that's a powerful one right there. Uh, to think enough of yourself to purposely place yourself in the path, not the semi-truck, but purposely place yourself in the path of God's blessings by simply applying these biblical teachings. Number four, though, requires a, doing a thorough job of repenting. A thorough job of repenting. Uh, how many of you would come home sometimes and the kids have been something they shouldn't have done and you're getting ready to discipline with the rod of discipline? Can we say that publicly? No, I still believe in that. Don't spare the rod. You won't die for it. You may cry out, but you won't die. All right. Uh, the rod of discipline made for the, for the fool. The Bible says the rod of discipline will have foolishness from the heart of a child. How many of you have ever been exercised by the rod of discipline? It's uh, called a paddle. I mean, if you haven't had that before. Okay. Um, and you, you came in and they realized they had it. And you went for the paddle, right? Our kids, their first thing. I gotta go to the bathroom. We better make it quick. <laughs> there was all, they always had a reason they couldn't come to where I was. But, you know, they, say, uh, they certainly, they were, would you agree they were sorry? Right? They were sorry they got God, but they were really sorry they died. It wasn't the God they saw that led to true repentance. Well, we're talking about third job of repentance. If it's hasty repentance, those are said it's shallow. You gotta be complete. And so when I got to think about this, like when we confess our sin to God, we normally pray something like, God, forgive me my sin. But we don't get specific. I would suggest from biblical teaching, be specific with what you've done. And then the God knows that you want to escape what you've done. You don't want to continue in that lifestyle. And that let godly sorrow produce its work, as Romans chapter 2 teaches. Tozer says, it is our wretched habit of tolerating sin that keeps us in our half-dead condition. Hmm. In fact, if you look through scripture, repentance is one of the major themes. It comes from the Greek word metaneo, meaning about face. When a soldier is given a command, about face, uh, when is he supposed to do that? Immediately. And how much of an about face is he to make? Completely. So if we're headed towards sin and God said about face, what, what part of the body should make the about face? The complete body, not like one twice. Not like Lot's wife. We look back. Some scriptures on repentance, Luke 13, verses 1 through 5. <clears throat> Jesus speaking to a crowd that thought everybody was worse sinners than they were. They thought everybody else was going to hell except them. Jesus said, unless you repent, you'll perish. In Matthew 3, Matthew 3, verse 8. When John was baptizing the people, the Pharisees had come to be baptized. And he wasn't baptized, he refused to. Until they repented, he said, bring forth fruit in keeping with repentance. In Acts 2, verse 38, the verse from which Richard read this morning, I appreciate the scripture to Richard today. Uh, Peter, before he mentioned the command of baptism, said what? Repent and be baptized. And every one of the churches, uh, all, not everyone, but all, there were at least five of the seven churches in the book of Revelation, that Jesus' final command to them was not was not going all the world to preach the gospel. His final command to them was, repent, repent, or I'm going to come and remove you from your place. Number five, make restitution wherever possible. I kind of calculated this at the beginning. I'm trying to keep going with the kid. I calculated I've got about 24 slides with about 30 minutes to do it, so I've got a minute slide. Maybe it's about over a minute there, so let's go on, shall we? How many of you have ever owed a debt to somebody and you didn't pay it? Well, Tozer said, make restitution wherever possible. If you owe a debt, pay it. If you quarrel with anyone, go as far as you can to achieve reconciliation. As fully as possible, make the crooked straight. In other words, right the wrong. Make right what you have made wrong. Now, in Luke chapter 19, verse 8, what do most people know? About you know this word association game. I'll throw out a name here, and just first thing comes to your mind, right? Zacchaeus. Right? How many of you thought little, short, boxy Jesus climbed the sycamore tree? Right? Yeah. Jesus. <laughs> Jesus says, "Come down, come to your house today." Well, that's where most people stop off with Zacchaeus. But in Luke 19, verse 8, after his encounter with Christ, here's what he said to the Lord. He said, "Lord, half of my possessions I give to the poor." And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, 
I'll give him back. Anybody remember how much he was going to pay back? I'll give him back four times as much. That's a good biblical principle, but I don't you're required to test him back four times. Like you stole something, you didn't just give back what you stole. You had to either double or triple. I like the four times. You defraud me of a hundred bucks, and you owe me four hundred. <laughs> at least that is, at least one is ten. So well, that's only if you defraud him. I tell you, he was serious about what he said because again, I'm going to you the literal Greek rendering that the Greek language was clearly understood by the readers and listeners. Because you could have said something, you know, if I defrauded somebody, I may have. I'm not really sure I'll check into that. So then I'll, I'll give four times much. It could have been an empty promise, right? But there was another way of expressing it in the Greek language. We can do it in the English language as well. I just did it one way in the English language. If I brought it in, if I can do it, I don't know. I doubt if I can. But the other way of saying it is this if I have defrauded anyone, and I know I have, I've got the record, I can prove it. I'll pay him back four times as much. And it's the second way that Zacchaeus is speaking that day to Jesus. He said, if I have defrauded anybody, and I know I have, I'll pay him back four times as much. Hmm. So he was serious, wasn't he? G Jesus said to him, and here, here's how I know he was serious, because of what Luke chapter 19, verse 9 says. Always helps to read another verse. But get Zacchaeus out of the tree, back down to the ground, back to reality, back to making restitution. Jesus said, today salvation has come into this house. Now that is the new one. That's renewal for the individual. Is that the way you find it in yourself? Another place the scripture talks about settling accounts, making things right. I was joking, joking with the men. A while back we had a really low offering. <laughs> I was joking with them about this passage. Matthew 5, verses 23 through 26. This is where Jesus taught us that if you are presenting your gift at the altar, and there you remember your brother has something against you, what are you supposed to do with the gift? Leave it there. Don't give it. Don't give it. Don't give your gift to God until you have gone and settled things with your brother. You're going to give your offering. And you say, oh, my God, I, got, I know somebody's upset with me. And you don't give that offering until you get things right with your brother. Then once you get things right with your brother, what do you do? You come back and give your offering. Man, a really low offering one Sunday. I said, the reason it was so low is because a lot of folks realized that one of their brothers or sisters was upset with them, so they kept their offering. So they got things settled. <laughs> then the following Sunday, you know, huge offering for them. Praise God, God. Got all things settled. Number six, bring your life into alignment, as you said before. Bring your life into alignment with biblical teaching. He mentions the Sermon on the Mount and other New Testament scriptures that are designed to instruct us in how to live right. And then he makes this, wow, it strikes to the heart. An honest man with an open Bible and a pad and pencil is sure to find out what's wrong with him quickly. Does anybody know why? Does anybody know why that if you're honest and you open the Bible and you look into the mirror here, does anybody know why we'll find out really quick? Because this mirror, as well as the mirror in your, in your home, in your bedroom, mirrors don't lie. Give an accurate reflection. When you look down, we're honest, we'll see it. And uh, we've got enough information in this book for 2 Peter 1 3 that if you're looking for answers, and if you're seeking answers, looking for knowledge, you have questions, you don't know the answer. What do I do with this? How do I handle this? What, what do I do here? How do I raise my kids? Kids, do tell them. Construct them, pick up one way, so they go to home. Peter said that God has given us everything that pertains to life and godliness through the true knowledge of Jesus Christ. There isn't a single topic you can come to me. So if I've got a question about this, I've got a question about this. I don't want to do this. What's about this? There's not a single topic on the planet anywhere, but what God's Word doesn't in some way address it and teach us how to progress. And in John 17, 17, how do you know what Jesus says when he said, Father, sanctify them the truth. Your word is true. And so my point here is this. And when he says, when this, this minister, point number six, when he says, bring yourself into alignment with the biblical teaching. Here's why. Because the Bible is the source of guidance on any matter in life, regardless of what it is. And God's ways are always true and always right. He's not left anything to chance. He's given us an answer for anything. He says all things pertain to life and godliness. We can know about it and study the life of Jesus Christ. And then number seven, this doesn't mean you can't laugh. It doesn't mean you can't have a good time, right? 
become seriously minded. Now, in his day, Tozer said that people in the world used to go to movies to escape serious thinking about that religion. Used to? And I think there are a lot of other ways that we seek to escape the serious nature of life. He said, if you want to have improvement in your interior life, there must be radical change. Radical change in your habits, or there won't be any improvement. And I'd like to give you another scripture, if I could. Is that okay this morning? To give you scripture, at least? 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. Again, I'm going to turn and take time for it. We're getting near the end here. Okay, but keep moving here. Can I come? I'm going to walk on that hill there on Main Street, getting on the high street. That snow is taking that. It's done, right? Is that okay? In 2 Corinthians 4, verse number 13, having the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, Paul says, I believe, therefore I spoke. We also believe, therefore we speak. Knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise, raise us up with Jesus and present us with you. For all things are for your sakes. So that the grace which is spreading from more and more people may cause the giving of thanks to abound in the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though our outer man is decaying, our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary, life affliction is producing for us eternal weight of glory far beyond the present. While we look not at the things that are seen, but at the things that are not seen, because the things that are seen are temporal, in other words, they're temporary, the things that are not seen. Are eternal. From those verses, there are so many ingredients that come into the approved life so that we can grow and be revived. He mentions in verse 13, faith. And in verse 4, 13, also because we have faith, because we believe, that's why we speak. He mentions in verse 14, the knowledge of his events. To be a servant in itself, just knowing how things are going to turn out in the end when the Lord comes. Now that's all going to work out in the world. Dead being raised and all that. But then he mentions also in verse 15 that you need to keep a proper motive for why you do what you do, even when you're suffering. And as a result, in verse 16, as the outer man is decaying, how many know your outer man is decaying, right? Right? right. Look at the picture from 20 years ago. <laughs> man, what happened? You know? You're decaying on the outer man. And Paul and Silas in Acts 16, when they were in prison, they had just been whipped and beaten. They were bleeding. Outer man was definitely decaying, but there they were singing praises to God and giving thanks. In other words, their inner man was being renewed. So, how many of you can understand then that if you have a proper perspective of suffering, the suffering is not always a bad thing. Paul said it's momentary, it's light, it's nothing in comparison to the glory that we're going to receive. And so, keep looking at the things that you can't see, keep looking to your eternal reward in heaven. And don't let your focus on these things right before you discourage you and cause you to have a downfall in your faith and walk with God. And that involves being sober-minded, seriously minded. Uh, our world, trying to escape reality, uh, look in the mirror again and say, man, I'm getting old. And the next thought is, man, I'm getting a lot older than I thought I was. And the next thing is coming to mind, someday I'm going to die. And that's why we need to be seriously minded. To live with the end in mind. Does it mean we can never tell a joke? Does it mean we never tell? No, it doesn't mean that at all. But there's a time to be seriously minded. As Paul told the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, who we weren't living like there was going to be a resurrection someday, he told them in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 30 to 34, in essence, he said, You need to become sober minded and sin not. And there, 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 there's that sin not again. And he literally penned the words. Become sober minded as you ought. Stop your sinning because some have no knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. shame. So remember, if you're just going to be complacent about this and always be compromising, half hearted devotion, it won't cut it for those of us who have been bought with Christ. Number eight, deliberately narrow your interests to many projects, eating up our time without bringing this nearer to God. I'll, pick, I'll share more on that at a later time. We've got to narrow a lot of things. We've got to narrow our vision, our energies, our devotions. We've got to intensify our resolve, our grit to do the work of hanging in. There. Number nine, begin to witness. Find something to do for God with the talents you have. Make yourself available. Don't do it. Don't, don't be saying no all the time when you're asked to serve. Now, I'll caution you here. When you're asked to do something, 
if you're not able to do that, truly able to do that, then then say so. You, you don't want me fixing a three course dinner for you. Right? Because it doesn't lie with all my belly. I can handle baked beans, macaroni and cheese, you know, that's about it. I can make that. That's, and that is my way for my good hamburger. If it's not within my ability, you know, I've got to, but if I can do it, you know what the challenges are. So if you're asked to do that and reach out to others, here's some scripture for your study Proverbs. If you want to be wise, that is Proverbs. Chapter 11, verse 30, talks about the wisdom of winning souls. Daniel, chapter 12, verse 3, talks about how you, you will shine like the stars of heaven if you do what's right and you bring others to Christ. Uh, Matthew 28, I think we're familiar with, but Matthew 28, 19 and 20. As you go, disciple all nations. Disciple and just teach others. Share what you know about Christ. Take your Bible and share what you've learned. Yeah, share the Bible. So let them read it. Let them respond. And when they say, well, what prevents me from being baptized? All you have to say is, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And then find water sufficient to immerse them. Revelation 22, verse 17, the Bible says that the Spirit of the Bible says, last chapter of the Bible. How many of you know that people can find their way to God without your help? People have. They've taken their Bibles, they've read on their own, they've studied their way to, to Christ. They found it. One man was, was down on the seashore in North Carolina. And a preacher by the name of Daryl Sprunner was on vacation. Oh, on his trees fell out. But anyway, he was on vacation down there in North Carolina. They come across this guy on the beach. They got to call him. The guy said, What do you do? We're living. Daryl said, I'm a minister. I'm a preacher. He goes, Thank God. He said, Will you baptize me? Daryl said, What do you mean? He said, And here the man had been studying the book of Acts on his own and had just read about the Ethiopia coming along water where he could be baptized. And Daryl said, Well, you believe with all your heart, you may. And he went out in the ocean right then. And Daryl baptized that guy. <laughs> now, how many of you know people can come to Christ without you saying a word, right? But the chances of coming to Christ are much better if you do say something. So open the mouth again to you. And then finally, let's talk that final. Number 10. For the first time you've been able to walk away since 2020. Number 10. 10 ways to turn. Not to grow or ten ways for the church to grow. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. A lot of scriptures on that we can share. Romans 10, verse 11. Whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. Psalm 27, verse 1. The Lord is my life. There's a song by that. The Lord is my life, my salvation. Who shall I fear? Who shall I dread? Who doesn't know Psalm 23? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. And, uh, so the next 45 seconds, get a pen, pen, I want you just as quickly as you can write down all the things you're worried about, all the bad things that are frustrating you, all the things that just got you at your wits head. And, and you're just like, good. I can't believe it. It's really, it's really, it's really. It can be anything. It can be crisis and things. 45 seconds. We're going to try for at least 45 seconds. Go. Someone just said, what are we supposed to do? <laughs> write down all those things. They're just grabbing your nuts. They're, they're freaking you out. You're afraid. Things of which you're afraid. Yes. Yes. Make me angry. Oh, make me think about doing some things you know you shouldn't do. Afraid of what? Step on my Christianity and punch on the step back in the ass for days. Then we're down to about 30 seconds now. 30. Let's see. Yeah. cut. Obsessive impulsive disorder. You need to grab nuts. You know exactly how many seconds you left. Anybody on your mind? 15 seconds yet? I like this cartoon. You know, Trey, I'm trying to share it with Rosemary. It's called Don't Worry. You see this guy's worried out of his head. He's worried about expenses. He's worried about the tiny bill. And one bird says, the other, What's he eating now? And the other bird says, I guess God doesn't take care of him like he takes care of us. <laughs> Based on that scripture of Jesus, you know, look at birds. God takes care of them. Won't he take care of you? You know? So, I'm going to go to the next slide again. But Anyone, anyone care to shout out some of those things you just wrote? Did anybody write down the price of gas? It went from $324 to $359 in one week. I don't know why I was waiting. Or why did I put it up? Actually, I didn't play that. I filled it up too late. Uh, anybody anybody put down corruption in the government? How about that guy out there in, down there in Alabama? Oh, no, boy, I don't know where that is right now. Is he still in, uh, in, in health and hospital? Man, 
You're that little boy. What that little boy did with the believer in Christ? Is a believer? I don't know if he is or not. Anybody want to call out anything else? Anybody put down corrupt politics <laughs> or murder of the innocent or the amounts of injustice or just the desecration of what's holy? Okay, so what I'd like you to do now is right before whatever you wrote is write this question. What shall I say to this? What shall I say to the price of gas? What shall I say to the fiscal flips? What shall I say to the insanity of man that thinks they can live without God? What can I say about this, this agenda of sinful living that's brought upon us and it's plaguing me and my children? Next slide. Here's what we need to say. Romans 8 31 says, What should we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? And that will remind you. Real believe it is, we can take that down from your heart. Individual revival, where to begin? The Bible begins with Christ, continues in you, or we stop by you. We need to lock those doors and we keep them unlocked. Not just the doors of this building, but the doors of the true church. That's you, not the building. So, God bless you this day as you go. You can be careful when you go, but before you go, make sure you go as a saved individual. Today is Saturday day. If I got Ethiopia to go back in my hand, look for the next thing. And being baptized. So, so you believe with all your heart in that. They commanded the church to stop, and Philip and the Ethiopians, both of them went down to the water. And Philip baptized him immersed The Bible says that the Ethiopians came up out of the water. They then went on their way. And the Ethiopians went on his way. Rejoice. As go to you this morning, so goes the rest of the body of Christ. May it be in a state of revival. God bless you. Let's sing. Let's stand gently as we exalt him. As we do that, we exalt him, lift him. He'll lift us. Let's go. He is the soldier, the king is the soldier, the king is the soldier, the 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 the
And I've got a sign up sheet back here, by the way. I'm going to need to get that when I go to the back. I'll get that for you. Next kid's fun. I can see a sign up on the back there. And then we'll let it take the pictures. Let's kind of go to the prayer. We'll let all the announcements there. Um, we'll do a couple quick things after the prayer. I'm going to go to the back. We've got a sign up sheet for ladies' night out. Maybe it's kind of like ladies' night. And then if you want your picture taken today, I've got a camera in my back pocket right here. I'm just going to come back up front. Do it with your hand lifts or your hand lifts. Do it with your hand lifts. Like to be a part of it. Thank you. Yeah. Lord, thank you for this guy. Ask for the blessing. Man. And, and Lord, it's just so good, refreshing to have him in our presence today. Thank you for the devotion to come out and join us and encourage us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Get that blessing. <laughs> Good sleep, Rich.